Allora stiamo per cominciare e come si usa in questi casi si comincia con i cosiddetti saluti istituzionali che saranno brevi perché abbiamo un'agenda un molto fitta e molto ricca. Allora uh, do la parola subito uh, alla dottoressa Alicia Boccaletti di Anziani Non Solo, uh, partner dell'università attraverso il centro di ricerca sulla discriminazione e la vulnerabilità dell'Università di Modena e di Reggio Emilia eh, da molti anni, devo dire. Eh, lì è un particolare piacere che sia tu ad aprire i lavori. Bene, grazie. Professor Zanetti. Allora, buongiorno a tutti. E intanto appunto un ringraziamento anche da parte mia per essere qui oggi. Eh, io vi porto i saluti di Anziani e non solo che è il, il partner italiano insieme alla regione Liguria eh, che eh, realizza qui nel nostro paese le attività del, del progetto IAPE. Io devo dirvi che quando ci è stato chiesto di partecipare a questo progetto insomma, per noi è stato da un lato, non si sente? È stato da un lato eh, un grande onore, un grande piacere ma anche eh, ne abbiamo percepita come una sfida perché è quello del eh, rischio e radicalizzazione eh, nel, nel, nei giovani è un tema eh, del quale noi non, non ci eravamo mai occupati prima, quindi una, qualcosa di decisamente nuovo. Però d'altra parte eh, abbiamo poi anche capito che alla fine questo progetto ci avrebbe dato la possibilità di mettere in pratica su un altro ambito, quindi un ambito nuovo per noi, eh, un po' quelle le idee, in qualche modo potrei dire anche i valori che la nostra cooperativa cerca di portare avanti insomma, dalla, dalla sua fondazione. Quindi sicuramente dei principi di solidarietà e di inclusione sociale, ma ancora di più eh, dei delle modalità insomma, di eh, sostegno all'empowerment delle persone e sostegno al loro sviluppo personale, capacitazione, insomma sono un po' queste le parole chiave eh, del nostro lavoro quotidiano e anche del, del progetto IAP. E, e quindi insomma vi dicevo per noi è una grande opportunità, una grande gioia poterci sperimentare anche su questo, su questo tema che oggi eh, certamente eh, nell'agenda, eh, al primo posto delle agende di, di chiunque eh, si occupi di, di lavoro sociale. E fra l'altro eh, il progetto IAP si pone l'obiettivo di lavorare su questo tema anche in un modo, lo sentirete, vi verrà presentato nel corso della mattinata, eh, in un modo particolarmente interessante perché intende occuparsi di giovani ma facendolo con i giovani e credo che questo sia un, uh, un elemento che caratterizza fortemente questo progetto, quindi noi coinvolgeremo uh, i ragazzi in tutte le fasi, abbiamo già iniziato nella, nella prima fase e lo faremo in tutto l'arco delle attività del progetto e quindi questo diciamo, ci dà anche la speranza di riuscire a trovare delle strategie più efficaci che rispondano davvero ai, ai, bisogni, ai bisogni dei ragazzi. Fra l'altro eh, oggi vi verrà anche presentato il primo risultato del, del progetto che è un report di ricerca che potrete poi scaricare insomma, a, partire, a partire da oggi è un report che abbiamo realizzato, in, una ricerca che abbiamo realizzato in tutti i paesi partner in, nei quali abbiamo visto un elemento comune e il fatto che si tratta di un tema ancora poco conosciuto, ancora poco esplorato e quindi la giornata di oggi diventa ancora più importante perché ci dà la possibilità di mettere a sistema quelle conoscenze che ci pur limitate ma che ci sono e ci dà l'opportunità di confrontarci e di cercare di fare dei passi avanti quindi per me è un grandissimo piacere essere qua oggi e spero davvero che sarà una giornata proficua e utile per proseguire questo lavoro così importante quindi grazie a tutti e buon lavoro Mi fa piacere adesso dare la parola a Maria Luisa Gallinotti della Regione Liguria che è uno dei partner istituzionali di questo progetto. Grazie professore. Allora, intanto porto i saluti del mio assessore, l'assessore Sonia Viale che è assessore tra le sue deleghe l'immigrazione ma anche le politiche sociali e il terzo settore quindi insomma raccoglie un po' tutti te i temi. Allora noi come Regione Liguria abbiamo aderito eh, molto volentieri effettivamente a questo progetto eh, proprio perché il fenomeno della radicalizzazione ci siamo resi conto è un fenomeno 
grave che sta emergendo, lo conosciamo poco, quindi assolutamente d'accordo con, con Licia, praticamente è, è un fenomeno che va studiato. E, e, diciamo, e va studiato eh, partendo da un modello di eh, prevenzione e mh, diciamo, per promuovere anche un, diciamo, un percorso di inclusione che sia un po' innovativo. E, mh, il, il fenomeno della radicalizzazione parte sicuramente da, eh, da discriminazione, dalla non inclusione, quindi bisogna lavorare lì in questi, in questi, in questi campi. E partner con noi e ovviamente e ovvi la cooperativa anziani e non solo che voglio ringraziare per l'organizzazione splendida di questa giornata che immagino assolutamente impegnativa e abbiamo anche altri appunto, partner europei, il Regno Unito sicuramente Grecia, Cipro, Italia Portogallo, Polonia, Svezia e Romania, quindi un partenariato importante, so che ci sono qui rappresentanti di, di, dei partner che voglio salutare e dare benvenuto in Italia per appunto, questa giornata di studio. E, il progetto, come giusto ricordavate, è in parte da lavorare con i giovani, quindi non è solo oggetto, qui mi fa piacere vederne tanti, non è solo l'oggetto dello studio ma è il soggetto che lavora insieme agli esperti su questa, su questa progettazione, quindi utilizzando delle metodologie innovative Punto. poi sentiremo i partner quindi sulla neuroscienza, psicologia positiva, progettazione e realizzazione guidata con gli utenti, eh, però una volta individuato il modello è importante sperimentarlo eh, nei diversi ambienti, quindi ecco lì che la Regione Liguria interviene eh, come partner, diciamo, come amministrazione locale, ma ehm, Diciamo, amministrazione e istituzione che può sperimentare nelle varie eh, sedi, scuole eh, piuttosto che eh, diciamo, nei distretti sociosanitari o in eh, organizzazioni eh, della società civile la, eh, diciamo, il modello che viene eh, elaborato dai, dalle università e dalle, dagli scienziati. E quindi eh, ecco lì che eh, insieme ai giovani noi vorremmo eh, trovare la modalità per raggiungere tutti i ragazzi che, e, e quindi individuare e capire quali sono eh, appunto il, i punti di, di, di forza e i punti di debolezza eh, de, del progetto e poi averne diciamo, il frutto che potremmo quindi portare nelle nostre politiche e nelle nostre... Quando, appunto, sperimentarle e, e utilizzarle nelle, nelle diversi eh, tavoli e nelle diverse azioni. E con noi è il Ministero perché abbiamo fatto poi una convenzione insieme al Ministero del Lavoro e delle Politiche Sociali e poi dopo appunto, avremo occasione di eh, presentare il direttore che è qui presente e, e insieme al Ministero cercare di fare tesoro delle, dei risultati e averli appunto nel, nelle diverse diciamo, occasioni di, del, di inclusione e delle politiche che vengono appunto utilizzate. Quindi insomma, diciamo, io non vorrei dilungarmi perché gli interventi sono tanti, so che sono importanti, quindi volevo semplicemente portare un saluto e un buon lavoro per i lavori per la giornata di oggi. Grazie a tutti. Artie Led parlerà alla fine, vedremo il podio alla fine. E è arrivata? Ah, in questo caso I would like to give the floor to Mrs. Artie Led. Uh, you should give the mic, no. You have a mic? If you can pass to her, please. Uh, I, I shall do that. I shall do that. It's not, it's not. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, great. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm representing the YAB, which is the Youth Advisory Board in the UK. And this topic, when it was first given to us at the at the board, it was it was quite emotive in the sense that not many of us had really reflected on it, and so thinking about things like youth radicalization and even terrorism for that matter is quite scary for us young people. And so when, when we were grouped together, we really thought, you know, what, what does this mean? You know, why are young people thinking, you know, this is a route for them? And for us, we, because 
most of us there, we, we hadn't really thought about it. And so we decided that the most important thing for us was that we needed more positive influences and access to um, resources, opportunities, especially equal opportunities. And I think from that, and especially when we were looking at the Good Lives model, we were thinking that is the, probably the best way to do it. And instead of you know, preventing radicalization, we thought the main thing that we needed to do was actually get to the root cause of the problem and think about you know, how can we start, stop it before it even begins. Um, because a scary figure that we found was that mainly the young people were people who were part of the terrorist crimes and they were aged under 25 years old. I mean, that's a shocking figure. And so, literally, we all thought access to opportunities, positive influences, and having that equal opportunity to be able to do, do better from the beginning, before it even starts. And government policies in the UK especially, they needed to tackle that. There needed to be more. And especially with it, you know, the prevalence of social media and online groupings and all of that, we thought, yes, everyone has a right for freedom of expression, opinion, and also assembly. But in these cases, I know it shouldn't be an infringement of people's rights, but is there a way that we can regulate online activity? Thanks. Is there a way that we can regulate online activity? Is there a way that this can be surveillance? You know, we, we need more to be able to stop this, um, especially because more young people are using social media. And I guess, going forward, technology is gonna play a big part in radicalization. And to stop it, I guess it begins from ways in which we can understand the young people, as well as hear their voices, and be able to understand what do we need to do to be able to tackle this issue before it even begins. I would like to call to the floor Mr. Professor Vincenzo Pacillo for the institutional greetings, uh, vice chair of our department who is hosting, physically hosting this event. Vincenzo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Francesco. Um, io sono particularmente onorato di dare il benvenuto a nome del Dipartimento di Giurisprudenza dell'Università di Modena a tutti i colleghi che sono convenuti da diverse parti d'Europa per partecipare a questo importante convegno. Io credo che sia necessario e doveroso eh, ringraziare il CRID, il Centro Interdipartimentale per lo studio sulle vulnerabilità, per il grandissimo lavoro che sta facendo e per aver dato la possibilità ad una città come Modena di ospitare i lavori di, questo, di questa riflessione che oggi assume un'importanza nodale all'interno di quelli che sono gli sviluppi della vita democratica dei nostri paesi. Um, mi è doveroso anche ringraziare la cooperativa Anziani e non solo, che sta lavorando al fianco del CRID su diversi progetti, e la regione Liguria per uh, il grande supporto che ci è stato dato, una regione che è in prima linea nello studio e uh, anche nel... Uh, nella concreta gestione di determinate questioni connesse alla radicalizzazione e che pertanto è un partner assolutamente privilegiato con cui è importante e doveroso confrontarsi. Um, vi rubo soltanto un minuto. Ieri eh, andavo a riguardare le, le, le parole di Nancy Rosenblum su quello che sono e di quello che è il ruolo ehm, del confronto che le società democratiche devono avere con le identità religiose radicali all'interno di quello che è lo spazio pubblico. La mia impressione da studioso dei rapporti di diritto e religione è che noi siamo di fronte ad un momento in cui non possiamo più far finta che queste identità forti esistano e che è necessario trovare da parte sia delle istituzioni accademiche sia della società civile degli strumenti concreti che possano attraverso il dialogo mettere queste identità forti all'interno di quello che è il panel 
di diritti e di doveri fondamentali che sono propri delle società democratiche. Eh, noi abbiamo tutta una serie di strumenti che possono istituzionalizzare il dialogo interreligioso e rendere il dialogo interreligioso uno strumento fondamentale di prevenzione della radicalizzazione violenta, penso agli strumenti di riconoscimento pubblico dei culti, penso al sistema di eventuali accordi o intese con le confessioni religiose, penso al ruolo del sistema dell'educazione e penso soprattutto a quelli che sono gli strumenti del Consiglio d'Europa, che il Consiglio d'Europa ci lascia, proprio per evitare che le identità religiose forti finiscano col diventare espressione di violenza. Ricordo a questo proposito l'articolo 3.3 della Convenzione del Consiglio d'Europa sulla prevenzione del terrorismo, Ricordo le parole eh, assai importanti dello special rapporteur sulla libertà religiosa Heiner Bielefeld nel suo report on, uh, on freedom of religion of belief, violence committed in the name of religion. E infine la risoluzione 1928 del 2013 eh, del Consiglio d'Europa su quello che riguarda la prevenzione della violenza per quello che riguarda le identità religiose. A mio avviso solo attraverso un lavoro serio di istituzionalizzazione del dialogo interreligioso noi possiamo dare alla radicalizzazione un vero e proprio stop che sia in grado di impedirne le degenerazioni violente e nello stesso tempo essere in grado di parlare, affrontare, metterci concretamente di fronte alle sfide che le identità religiose forti portano alle nostre culture ormai secolarizzate. Vi ringrazio e auguro a tutti buon lavoro. Grazie. Va bene, la fase dei saluti istituzionali è terminata per il vostro sollievo. The institutional greetings phase is to your relief over. Now down to work. Before we start, uh, I switch to English just because now we are actually getting in the marrow of it. I would like to thank those people who actually organized this event. Uh, First and foremost, Licia Boccaletti, of course, but also Alessandro Di Rosa, Elena Mattioli, Matteo Zattoni, and above and beyond everybody else, Manuela Tagliani, who I know has been the marrow and bone. She worked night and day for this event. Thank you, Manuela, very much, and thank you to everybody else that I forgot to mention that actually gave his or her contribution to the physical organization of this important day. You know, I'm here only because I happen to chair the, the Center for about Vulnerabilities and Discrimination that uh, Vincenzo Pacillos kindly uh, mentioned. Uh, we do believe in our center that, uh, I'm talking to the young students here, you know, that we, we cannot teach uh, the way we were used in the old days. Yes, that pattern of teaching is still valid, but unfortunately oh, is not enough. You need to work hands on, you need to see people who are actually in the middle of it, uh, dealing with important problems which will haunt us if we do not start to deal with them right now. Uh, I was particularly pleased to hear uh, the words by R.T. Ladd who said, you know, we have to take action before everything begins, you know, at the very root of the problem. Now I'm happy to give the floor to Theo Gabrielides, I, I double checked with him if the pronunciation is correct because you know you never know with family names, who is actually the founder and the director of the IARS International Institute and is the coordinator of this youth empowerment and innovation project. So basically I'm going to give the floor to, to the boss of the whole project and I'm looking forward to hearing him. Theo? Good morning, buongiorno. Uh, well, no pressure. Um, yeah, um, I might be the boss, but um, I'll just take the responsibility for what goes wrong. Um, I shouldn't take the, um, the credit, so I'll, I'll also thank, I'll start by thanking the organizers, the university, um, Anziani and uh, Lissia and her team. They've been fantastic, and this is not the only project we're doing together. We're doing many other projects uh, for the European Commission. So what I'm going to try and do, um, I'm going to um, articulate, I think I'll, I'll try and articulate why um, I wrote the project in the first place, why we asked for funding for this project. So describe the project um, and our ambitions uh, and why this project is different. And then I'll, I will very briefly um, 
present the first findings. Um, it's just the first um, year of the project. It's very new. Um, and these are the first research findings. So we've got a long way to go. And the three objectives, I would say, for um, this event, or what I would like to see from this event, is obviously to increase awareness about the project, so tell you about the project. And there's a knock-on effect. You get excited about the project, and you go out there and tell more people about the project. And I'll tell you why that is important in a minute. Um, the second one is to hear from you. So I'll, I'll, I will try, and if St. Clair also tried to be concise and then leave enough time for questions and debates. And then, of course, we've got an exciting day ahead. And I'll be back um, at the end of the um, event to take more questions. Because I think, as Lucia said and everybody said before me, this is not, it's the beginning of it, it's a bottom up, it's a youth led project. And I'm very glad to see so many young people in the room. Um, it changes the dynamics and it changes what we're going to go and say today. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy actually I didn't do a lot of uh, slides, I only got four. Um, and, and it's very important that we hear from you. So don't just sit there, nod or um, agree with us, challenge us, ask us questions and be part of the day. Uh, that's the second objective and if we can achieve that, that would be, that would be great. And the third one is to do networking. Uh, um, a key objective of the project is to work with as many people as possible, and we all have a role to play. Artists said this is not about um, doing something after uh, bad things happened. This is about doing things before. So this is about prevention. Um, and, and I'll just start from, from that premise, and then I'll go on to presenting um, uh, the project. I just came back from a Council of Europe meeting about radicalization, and there were 20 experts. I hope this is not filmed, because if it goes online, I'm in trouble. Um, <laughs> and none of them were comfortable using the word youth radicalization. It was an expert meeting for youth radicalization, but nobody wanted to say the terms youth radicalization. And when I said, um, hang on, I'm, I got, I'm, am I in the wrong meeting? Did I come to the wrong country? They said, no, no, no this is a, this is a, so you're fine, you're in the right meeting. Said, so why we're not talking about youth radicalization? It's like a swear word. You can't talk about youth radicalization because everything that revolves around that term has been attached to something bad. So if you go into a school and say, oh, we came here with this fantastic material, you know, that would help your school not to go down the, you know, the route of having potentially students that might be radicalized. So, well, we don't have that problem here. You know, no, nobody's radicalized. And if you go to university, the response will be the same. You go to any institution, the response will be the same. So for us, using that language from the beginning was a challenge. Um, so here's the twist, if you like. And that's why I think being brave. Yes. <laughs> you can try. Alejandro, can you help, please? Let's, let's oh, wait for that. Dr. Rigosa. Okay, I can do that yeah. for you. It's no problem. Okay, thank you. It's only four of them. So, <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, these are, these are the kind of the content of what I'm going to uh, say. Before I move on to the next slide, I've got a little um, uh, cartoon there. It says, I have no idea what I'm going to do, um, and I'm actually loving it. And that's, that actually, I put that on the application when we when we uh, sent it to the European Commission, who is, by the way, the funder for this project. Um, and what do I mean by that? I mean, we had, I had this idea that something is going wrong. Um, Einstein said it, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting something different to happen. Um, so I thought something different needs to happen. Um, but I said, if something different needs to happen, us academics sitting in our high ivory towers looking down wouldn't do that. So I thought the best way to do it is to let it go, um, identify the methodology, and the methodology is quite you know, very scientific and very prescriptive, so it's about you know, qualitative research, quantitative research, following the principles, following the, the robust methodologies that will not then allow governments or other institutions to question the validity of the results. Um, but at the same time, it was important that we don't preempt the results. So I said, we're going to let young people to tell us the themes. 
we're going to let young people let, lead the uh, research and we're going to lead um, leave young people to reach the conclusions and their recommendations. So I am actually quite, quite happy and excited that I don't know what's going to come out of it. And for somebody who coordinates a project, that's a very, very difficult thing to do because if you are a control freak, or I am, you have to go through a very, you know, uh, calming um, and, um, uh, you know, training period to allow yourself to get to that stage. Um, but I think that is what is going to make this uh, project different. And there are projects out there um, that are funded by the European Commission um, on uh, radicalization. It's not the only project. Um, and there are the projects at a national level or local level. So we've got to do things differently. Um, and here, is the, um, um, here, here, here are the aims of the Youth Empowerment and Innovation Project. So if you think of, um, I'll try and, and conceptualize first what the problem is, if you, if you like, and then attached to that are the aims. So if we think of um, a young person or any individual who commits crime, it doesn't necessarily have to be attached to terrorism or radicalization. And we're going to talk about what terrorism means in different contexts, in different countries. In, in, in Italy, for instance, we say uh, uh, radicalization or extremism and uh, we think of mafia. In Greece, we think of something else. In the UK, we think of something else, right? So if we think of the individual that gets engaged in, in that activity, our instant response is to minimize the risk, is to do something about that problem. So we put them in prisons, we uh, engage in rehabilitation programs, we, if they have drug issues, then we uh, go through drug treatment programs and so on, right? That's the normal way, or normal way, the criminal justice system way of addressing the issue. Now, there is a recent literature and a new approach where it says, well, before you get to the point of looking at the individual as a risk and managing that risk through the different systems that we have set up, maybe there is a different way of looking at it and looking at them as potential talent and tapping into those talents. And before they get to a point where they go down the path of marginalization, exclusion, and hence potentially radicalization, what are the things that need to be engaged so that that path and that journey stops? And that was the initial thinking. At a European level, there is nothing around that. There is no strategy, there is no policy, and there are no tools that will allow practitioners or young people themselves to get engaged in those activities, in those opportunities, in the theoretical and practical tools that would stop that path. So we thought, okay, so the European Commission is interested in these new innovative ideas that might help in their journey of preventing radicalization. And we said, we will look into that, we'll bring together a few European countries and a few partners and do some research. First of all, um, look at what out there exists, so in terms of literature, in terms of practices. Then we'll carry out field work in a youth-led way, speak with young people, speak with practitioners, create an evidence base, and then create tools that will then be piloted in different environments. And they were convinced. Um, as I said, it's the beginning of the project, and this is the first international conference. Now, what um, um, they gave us, and it was kind of part, part, part of the structure of the project, was the fact that the organizations that were leading the research, so there's um, seven of them in seven countries, so research bodies, such as Anziani is one of them for Italy, had to work with a public authority. So this particular call was for a public authority consortium. And a public authority such as a ministry had to lead on it. We are the coordinators, but we're not a public authority. My organization is a small organization that 15 years, when I was a young person myself, thought I set it up to bring young people together from Europe to do something about it. One thing led to the other. We took on other strands, such as equalities and justice, 
um, and we continue to be a small organization. How do we end up leading on this 18 partner consortium? Because um, we went to the Home Office, which is the main ministry in the UK dealing with radicalization, and they're the ones responsible for the, sure you've heard of the prevent strategy that had a knock on effect in the entire probably world in at least Europe in terms of how we approach uh, radicalization. And we said, look, uh, there's this uh, opportunity to get some funding from the European Commission and allow young people to complement and tell you about your prevent strategy, um, but also working with other young people. I don't know how I did it, but they said, fine, you can just go ahead and do it. Uh, just let us know what comes out of it. So I got away with it. They signed that off, um, and they passed on the uh, responsibility and their coordination to us while they remained as a partner. Um, so each country, seven countries, and we've got um, Italy, UK, uh, Greece, Cyprus, Romania, Portugal, and Sweden, have one public authority, whether it's at the national level or uh, a regional level, um, so such as a ministry, and then one research organization, which is an NGO. We also have two target groups, one university and one um, organization that works in the community uh, with uh, um, young people in prisons or youth offending institutions or different environments. And both of them are here. One of them is sitting next to me, representing the university. And there is a speaker from Kalisa who's going to talk to you about their work uh, later. Um, so we started from that good premise that we have a good, solid partnership with one at least public authority, which if any other uh, authority doesn't listen to what we're saying or the findings, at least one of them will, will listen, um, at least because I put them in at least two of the, of the international meetings. They have to go to these meetings um, and, and, and listen to what we're saying. So we have that um, good starting point. The other good starting point is that the European Commission meets at least once a year to get the findings from us and directly get the feedback and the recommendations which then will feed into the different strategies and the different policy documents that this particular program is supposed to inform. Which is why I said your views are very, very important because they will feed into that process. Uh, and those documents are very specific documents, they're called the youth strategy or the security strategy. Um, they're very specific documents that are being in you know, being developed, um, and this element that I mentioned before, the positive way of looking at the issue has not been explored yet. So that's, it's very innovating in that respect. Okay. Um, one, one, two, four. Oh, okay. So right and left. Okay. So to go back, this Okay. Right. I'm getting there. <laughs> So what is, um, what is the most challenging and innovative thing about YAPE? Well, um, I, I mentioned about the new approach, but I think the most challenging thing, which um, we're going to have to work really hard, and if the partners don't pull this off as the boss, I will have, uh, they will have consequences. You know, the m money is not going to go there. Uh, and that is that it has to be youth-led. The methodology has to remain youth-led, um, and by that, I mean that young people themselves, young people like young people who are in this room, um, will be supported through a training program to become peer researchers, to then go and work with other young people, whether they are in different environments, like, such as a university or a school and so on, to um, ask questions, really hard questions, and speak the language they, that you speak, that young people speak. Uh, that is very important um, for the project. We don't want to replicate stuff that is already out there. And this conference is launching the books that are telling us what is out there. So we know what is out there, and we will talk about those things uh, in a minute. And this day is dedicated to talking about the things that are out there. The next stage will be about the empowerment of young teams in all seven countries so that they go and do the research themselves and that comes back to us for quality control, peer review, publication and the engagement of the policy So that is, I think, one of the most challenging but at the same time the most innovative 
aspect of this project. Um, academically or research methods wise, this is, 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 there is a terminology for it, is user-led research, is youth-led research, is peer participatory research. There is some literature on it, there is not a lot on it, but it's in development. And in addition to adding to the uh, literature on radicalization and youth policy, we hope that would also add to the research methodology literature. And we will make mistakes. You know, we will make mistakes as we do the research. We will make methodological mistakes. We will make all sorts of mistakes. But how can you develop research methods if you don't make mistakes? As long as those mistakes are stated, our limitations are stated, our sampling strategies are stated, um, I think another aspect, an addition, that this project will have is to enhance the, the user-led um, research methods and the youth-led research methods so that in the future, when the European Commission funds more youth projects, hopefully people will have seen the youth-led research method or your university or other universities or academic journals will see the youth-led research method or the user-led research method and develop it further because it's a new area in terms of how we do uh, research. Right, so where, what do we want to achieve? As, as I said, uh, this is not um, just a scientific project. It also has specific social policy impact indicators and implications, and they work at three different levels. They work at the local level, so let's just take your city. So you have to see some sort of change at your local level um, after the project's finished. You need to see changes at your national level, and you need to see changes at the European level. Now, how do we go about doing that? And that's kind of a, a tall order, is that once the scientific results are done and the tools have been tested, as a knock-on effect and as a commitment from the different public authorities, we should see changes in legislation and policy. Now, when those things are implemented, we would expect positive things to happen. We would expect um, you know, what we all want to see, uh, reduction and prevention. Um, and we have some indicators for that, and that works at all seven country level. So, moving on now. So what did we achieve so far? So it's been, we started this project 1st of March last year. Um, apart from having lovely meetings and talking about what we're gonna do, we also do, we did on all seven countries, um, secondary mainly research. And that research looked at what exists um, in our countries in terms of um, the positive way of looking at the issue and a holistic way of approaching it. Um, so we looked at literature in native languages. We also looked at practices that might be implementing this new approach. And we also mapped the key people, the key organizations that are involved in our own countries in this issue of prevention of radicalization. And as a result, we produced two lovely books, um, and you're going to hear a lot about these books, and you are hopefully going to go on the project website, which is www.yape.org, um, and you can download um, the, both versions of these uh, books. Uh, they're free, all the material is free, and all the stuff that are going to come out of the, of the project are free. And there's two versions for a reason. One is a version where the national partners wrote the chapters in their own languages. So you've got Swedish, Greek, Italian, uh, Portuguese, and Romanian. And I was very passionate about this because me being Greek and living in the UK, I have passion about not using English as the global language, which also includes academia and uh, the academic literature. And if you look at what exists out there, most of it is in English. Why? Why would a young person in Moderna know English or a teacher in a school in Romania know English? It's very important that if we're going to have an impact on these people and not just for another policymaker in Brussels, that they can read in their own language. So it was an absolute pleasure when we, all the partners, um, agreed to that, but also agreed to translate things like press releases and uh, the website and the training material and everything that's gonna come out in native languages. Um, 
we are Europe. We are not uh, the United States of America. You know, we are the United States of Europe. And um, despite Brexit, um, <laughs> we've, got, we've got to all accept the realities of Europe, and that means a lot of languages and a lot of cultures and a lot of differences. Um, so that's um, the version of uh, the book that we have. Um, and those who speak only Italian can just read the Italian chapter and what takes place in Italy and so on. The second version is um, the same but translated into English. And there is a shorter version for those who don't have a lot of time to read, which is the summary that kind of I put together by uh, cutting and collating the different bits and bobs from the other chapters. I had fun during my Christmas doing that. Um, um, so, you know, you can read the executive summary and, and get the, uh, from the English kind of uh, perspective what, what, um, what the book is about. Uh, so that's, that's what we've done. And what the uh, findings now are saying... Oh, so these are the books. Website. Um, well, I kind of put it down to five points, really, because the day is about the findings and is about um, learning uh, from you. Um, okay, so we're at a point when we talk about radicalization, we're at a point when, um, well, what September the 11th happened, I think everything changed. And two big things changed. Um, one, we realized that actually people who commit these activities, whether they're called terrorist activities or extremism, extremist acts, hate crimes, all those sort of things, actually they're not just one or two people. Uh, they, are, uh, they could be very well organized, they are networks, they are well funded, um, and there's a difference in the type of uh, crime that exists, which in reality, and if you look at all penal codes, doesn't exist as a crime. So when you say theft, you go into the penal code, article, whatever, and it says theft is the removal of an object or of an idea, da 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 da, da which is uh, uh, penalized by this, and da 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 da. So, a definition, and then if you fall within that definition, the criminal court will find you guilty. When you talk about this sort of activity, it does not exist. Um, and what we started to realize after September the 11th, when the Twin Towers came down, is that this crime is more than a crime. It's, um, it's something that shakes the foundations of our hopes and actually what we take for granted of our ability to live together. And it corrupts that ability. You know, the foundations of our society. It creates fear, which is the ultimate objective of an act. And what is even more scary is that it is not confined within a geographical space. So it could, it is not something that, let's say, Germany invaded, I don't know, the UK or France or <laughs> Italy is now a partner of Germany and they're invading Greece. <laughs> you know, forget about all that. We moved on. Now we're talking about a terrorist network somewhere um, has um, attacked the Twin Towers. Figure it out. It's a new era of, of, um, of radicalization. And yes, there are the so-called lone wolves and individuals that we've seen um, committing these terrorist attacks. And there is a different uh, approach to that. Uh, but in reality, these are very well organized networks, very well funded, and they don't exist in a specific country. They exist everywhere. So that's, that's the reality of it. Now, the second thing that happened after September the 11th um, is that we, in the fear of experiencing this sort of massive event, we all subscribe to a corruption of something that we all fought for as, um, as humanity. And that was after the Second World War. We all came together and we said, never again. And we signed Europe, uh, European conventions, international conventions, the UN Declaration of Human Rights. We signed the European Convention of Human Rights and so on. 
And we said to individuals, these are the guaranteed principles and rights that you have as a human being, not as a migrant, not as a woman, not as a, as a human being, and this is your power against states, against the abuse of, of that humanity by states. But in the fight of terrorism, we consented to corrupt and to erode those rights. Um, I think it was, um, I can't remember, it was um, back in the US when they were setting up the US Constitution, um, was it Madison that said the worst enemy is the enemy that comes from within, not the enemy that comes from abroad. Um, and by that he meant be careful when uh, your rights are not uh, jeopardized by external forces, but by your own politicians and your own government. And to some extent I understand the fear of um, security, but on the other, we have entered into an era where human rights have been moved from being a given to being at the bottom of this process. So that's the two things that kind of happen, and we have to take that in, into consideration for this project. This is the reality of, and this is the, the framework within which we're working. The other thing is that what um, Lucia mentioned is that it's, this is very new, so it's very distorted. The picture is very distorted, and there is no clear understanding of you know, the factors, the criminological factors, the uh, what is happening, and Europe is a big place. The um, different realities um, in France, the different realities in Italy, and so on, um, determine and give context to this crime. It's, it's not consistent, um, and there's a very distorted picture. So while we're dealing with the issue, that distorted picture might actually never be addressed, might never be a clear picture, but it's something that we need to take into account. And any tools that we create, they need to make sense for that particular locality, for that particular geography, so that the distorted picture is not a distorted picture anymore. And also, the other thing that was consistent is that sometimes there is even no statistics. So I remember in Cyprus and Greece, they don't even record how many people uh, would be put in prison for extremism. Uh, there is no classification in the recording of official statistics. So when you are a criminologist, you go and say, okay, so how many people are actually, we actually commit? No, we don't know. Um, some countries might do that, so in the Home, in the, the home Office um, has been doing that, so there's a clearer picture there. But there is no, you know, there is no good understanding at a European level. We all talk about all this, you know, yes, we had three um, attacks in the UK last year, three attacks, and I think seven um, threats, but we all talk about this massive, um, you know, blow of loads of people doing it, but actually we don't have statistics to say that they're doing it. We just feel like it's happening. Uh, we read newspapers, Daily Mail, and all sorts of newspapers that they're not basing their arguments on facts, but on emotions, yeah, and that's, that's what we currently have. And Unfortunately, policy is developed with those myths. It's not developed on evidence, right? Um, so that's the other thing that you know, we need to be aware of, not just because you know, we're trying to inform policy in an evidence-based way, but also there is not a lot out there to help us. You know, we, we need to create the evidence ourselves. Um, the fourth thing, um, I think I need to wrap up very quickly. The fourth thing that kind of comes out is that the young people who were engaged in the first phase and they weren't engaged to create an evidence base, they were engaged, there was a, work, a, a workshop in each country once the first draft was finished. And the intention was to youth proof it. And it wasn't to engage the young people to get feedback about their realities, it was to youth proof the, um, the drafts. And the feedback that was coming out was that um, what we're doing actually doesn't, I mean, as, as, as Arthur says, it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, why, why would we talk about youth vitalization? Hang on a minute. You know, I'm in university, I'm studying, I'm trying to do, you know, good in society. Why are you telling me about youth radicalization? Um, it's, a good, it, it's not a good um, starting point to start uh, addressing the issue. But what um, made sense, it was 
was the human rights approach, what, or what I call the human rights approach. And by that, I don't mean specific articles or conventions. I mean, what are the tools that would empower young people to avoid going down the path that might lead them to marginalization? So it's all about the principles of fairness, equality, dignity, respect, and just empowering people through those principles. And finally, young people just say, well, finally, it's our turn. You know, we need to speak up. We might not get it right, but at least we'll be able to speak up and say what the realities are. And I think we kind of owe that because the policies and the practices so far have been from the top down. So why not give it a go? Right, so this is what we're going to do next. We're having this conference. Um, and as I said, this conference is part of the consultation, right? Once we finish this, we go into doing um, the field work. So young people will be empowered. They're going to go out there in seven countries, collect evidence, and then they'll come back with the evidence and we design um, this, what we call policy measure. And this policy measure, we have a model that we think will work. It's a positive model. A toolkit, so this is the model and this is how you do it at policy level. And then um, tools for practitioners, a training program that will be both online and accredited, but also face to face. So we'll go into different environments and pilot this program, this training that is based on this model, these principles, right? And this environment, this um, implementation, this piloting will happen in four different places. We know that these actions take place in schools, in universities, in youth offending institutions, and online. So all these things will be tested and piloted in all these four environments. The findings will come up and compare them with what's been happening in those four environments without the tools. So here's a group of people who have gone through these interventions that have been trained, so let's say you know, um, uh, Prevent uh, Plus, and then these are the group of people who have gone through programs that are just prevent. Is there any difference? And just look at it over a period of time. And that will come back with a triangulation of the findings at a European wide level. So we're going to have online questionnaires that will run for 24 months, asking different people from around Europe in different languages about the same stuff. All comes back uh, for my pleasure. And then I kind of go through it and produce the final recommendations for, for the commission. That's the plan. Um, I will stop there. And I think uh, what um, uh, St. Clair will next do is just unpack a little bit this idea about the positive approach. Um, just going to wrap up by saying that You know, for, for me, I've been involved in different kind of projects before, and we've done a few projects at a European level, but this is the first time that in its magnitude, in its funding, but also in its approach, it's a challenge for us. You know, it's not a challenge just for Italy, it's not a challenge just for, um, for Anziani, it's a challenge for me at a personal level, it's a challenge for anyone who um, is out there, whether it's what they call a young person, a policymaker, a father, a mother, a school teacher. Um, and I think if we all kind of participate in this and take the opportunity in one way or another, and there's lovely flyers that can tell you how to get involved, uh, come to the trainings, give us your views, uh, go online and get the accreditation, download the books, contribute, publish with us, um, help us create a culture. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Theo Gabrielides, for this engaging, interesting, and uh, not too long presentation. Uh, you know, sometimes having to do with control fix is a good thing, even if you don't look like uh, one. It's my now pleasure to give the word to Sinclair Cord, who's the head of academic department of social work and integrated care. Buckinghamshire New University, UK, United Kingdom, and which is a partner of our project. Uh, Sinclair, the floor is yours. Yep, yeah, thank you very much. And good morning all. Welcome. And um, first of all, it's good to see so many young people here. Really, it is. You know, I didn't know who was going to be here, who we were going to talk to, and I thought it would be the usual uh, room full of academics, stuffy, um, elderly, mature academics, and 
Um, so as Fionn said, young people's presence does bring a different dynamic, so welcome, it's good. And in a sense, it will be perverse in a youth-led research project like uh, uh, Yike, if there was no young people here. So uh, um, I'm glad we haven't got that perversion here. So welcome. As uh, has been said, my name is Sinclair Coward, and I'm an academic. I'm the head of academic department for social work and integrated care in uh, Buckinghamshire New, New University. <clears throat> my background is in uh, education, so I was a formal school teacher. Um, it's also in uh, social work. It's also in um, working with young people who had emotional and behavioral difficulties. And um, it's also in uh, youth work. And um, as a practitioner and as a researcher for all of the, uh, all of the above. And so I'm, I'm happy to join you here today. First of all, also let me uh, uh, say thank you to the organizers. They, you know, they've been very, I think, efficient. And, and they've put together this uh, conference very, uh, um, very well. You know, it's very well organized. I'd like to thank them for that. And for inviting me to clarify my thoughts around the good life model and positive psychology. Um, <clears throat> In so doing, in clarifying my thoughts, I also want to clarify your thoughts about what those two concepts are. Those two are fundamental concepts that underpin the Youth Empowerment Project. And it's good to hear Artie say or stress how uh, the young people uh, in, in their forum promote and positively um, back and put forward the good life's model as an underpinning philosophy. It's good to hear that. And um, so I want to uh, unpick it for you today. And I know that the partners at a recent meeting in London, um, they were expressing just what is the good life model? What is it? There was a bit of confusion around what it is. So hopefully today all shall be clarified. Okay, let's uh, um, press on. So as I said, I want to look at what the good life model is I, um, and positive psychology. I want to look at, and there's some jargon there in terms of epistemological, philosophical, and theoretical. I just want to look at where they come from. What are the underlying underpinnings, the underlying assumptions from where they came from? That would understand us, hopefully. That would help us to understand um, where they are now. So I'm going to look at some of those um, factors. And, um, and then I'm going to look at where those two concepts, a good life model and positive psychology, come together and how they impact on the youth empowerment project. And um, so that's what I'm going to do. On the way, I'm going to touch on the strengths-based approach um, that we're undertaking um, to working with young people, issue of radicalism. I'm going to touch on some questions of definitions. They're important here. Fiel mentioned um, a number of terms, you know, radicalization in itself. What does that mean? Terrorism in itself. What does it mean? For young people to be described as vulnerable to radicalization? What does it mean for young people to be described as at risk of, of um, radicalism? All of these terms are quite, um, they can do with some clarification, basically. Um, so I'm going to touch briefly on those. Um, <clears throat> OK, so in a sense, I'm going to raise more questions and answers, I think, but that's my aim. So um, don't, don't be surprised at that. Okay, so first of all, we're going to look at the good life model. So just what is this model? And sorry for turning around. I have to turn around now to make sure it's up there. I haven't got a monitor in front of me. Okay, so in terms of the good life model, what is it? Essentially, when somebody commits a crime, the state has got a number of choices as to how it can respond. It can punish or it can rehabilitate. Uh, or it can do both, of course. <coughs> A rehabilitation is basically an attempt to save somebody, save an offender from, from a life of crime. And over the years, there's been two main ways uh, that developed um, for rehabilitation, and they go under two acronyms. I think Theo mentioned them too. One is the, the risk needs response, responsivity um, model, and the other is the good life model. Two main models that um, emerged over the years in terms of rehabilitating offenders. I'm not going to go into detail about those two. I'm, I'm going to bore your, uh, I don't want to bore you to tears. Suffice to say that those two models, the risk-need responsivity model and the good life model, 
are often posited against each other as if they're in opposition. But I think they've got more in common. Um, I think they complement each other more than they divide. The main difference, as far as I can see, the main difference as far as I can see, and there will be people here who may have a different opinion, is that the um, risk need responsivity model, model um, is more focused on reducing the threat of crime to the community, to the community as it impacts the community, whereas a good lives model is more concerned about the welfare of the offender, the welfare of the offender. Okay, not that it ignores the risk to the community or the threat of further crime, but it's a degree of emphasis between the two approaches, and um, <clears throat> one that's more con person centered to the offender and one that's more concerned about the, uh, the community. And uh, um, broadly speaking, that's where I would, how I would describe both of those models. So we have two quotes up here in terms of the good life models, the good life model, and that comes from the original thinkers of these models. And um, so what it is, it's a strengths-based approach to um, offender rehabilitation, and it's based on the idea that, um, <coughs> that offenders, that in need to reduce a reoffending, we need to build the capabilities of people. And we're here, we're talking about young people and their strengths. So, um, and again, as Vio said, this is an emphasis on the individual. In, a, in essence, it's a person-centered approach, a person-centered. So what is it about this person that leads them to the life of crime? So instead of looking at the consequences on the community of their crime, we're looking at inside this person to build them up, build up their strength, their capabilities, their skills, so that they choose other paths in life. And that the um, opportunities and the desire to offend in reduces. That captures a good life's model. The same authors say the goal is to equip offenders with capabilities to meet their needs, pursue their interests, and therefore live happy and fulfilling lives. That more or less just reinforces why I said in terms of the focus on uh, internal mechanisms for young people. The bullet points there really are the principles involved in the good life model. So it's grounded in principles of human rights. It stresses people's human rights and human agency. So it stresses the choices that people have, gives people, it recognizes that young people have choices to offend or not to offend, and um, it recognizes that they need to be involved in any decisions about life plans and life goals. We can't work together to reduce offending by imposing goals on people. They have to have human agency. It's a strengths-based approach, and I'll come back to that in a minute, um, in that it accentuates the positive rather than um, dwell on the negative, and it, it um, proceeds by identifying life goals for these young people and um, plans to implement these goals. And at the final, the final point there is the expectation is that the intervention is aimed at improving the quality of the offender's life and uh, maximizing the ability to reduce recidivism. Um, so, good life's approach is posited against the other traditional approach which looks at, um, which focuses on the risk to the community. This one looks at the individual building up their capability, building up their capacities, and um, so that they make better choices in life. If you want, the good life's model is very, um, it's all over the internet. There are a number of um, ways how to do it, a lot of plans, because it does end up in, in an actual plan. So the practitioner and the young offender is going to sit down together and um, throughout your dialogue with that young person, you come up with an actual plan aimed at um, their goals in life. And I'll come into that in a minute. So there will be an actual plan, and there's examples of those in the, uh, on the internet. So when we look at positive psychology, similarly to penologists, um, when they 
talk about, you know, you can either do the risk need responsivity model or the good life model. Positive psychology says that if you want to improve your life, you have a similar choice of um, improving a human condition. You have a similar choice between a positive and a negative. So you can either strengthen what is good in somebody's life or you can um, <coughs> relieve what is negative in the person's life and it's not working for the individual. And um, positive psychology is um, firmly focused on accentuating the positive. So in a sense, it's an umbrella term for theories and research about what makes life, what makes life worth living. And in a sense, it was a pushback against traditional psychology, which tended to pathologize people, tended to look at what they can't do, tended to look at all the negatives um, ar around them. And we said, uh, we set that aside, let's look at what works for people and um, what motivates people. And that would be a better, we think, a more, um, <clears throat> more accomplished way of motivating people to make better choices. So the <coughs> comparison between positive psychology and a good life model at once becomes clear in terms of their stress on the, uh, um, on the positive. So positive psychology also is um, a scientific study of strengths and virtues that enable individuals and communities to thrive. Reading about positive psychology, you come across that word scientific a lot because they like to stress that um, their theory rests on a, a fertile research base. So empirically, it's been proven that positive psychology works and this is using random, randomized controlled trials, the so-called gold standard research to show that, yes, this approach does work. We're not... Um, promoting any um, theory that's uh, in doubt at all. This is, this is a working approach. And um, that the interventions, the interventions in positive psychology are also proven to work. And, um, and the aim is increasing well-being. And I've put two references there of randomized control trials in positive psychology to show that it does work. There is a bibliography at the end of everything here that you're seeing and that you can follow up yourself to uh, um, <coughs> prove to yourself and that, you know, find out for yourself that they do work and that they do rest on a solid um, foundation of research. So the positive psychology and good life's model, um, in summary, those two are as they are. Sorry about the darkness of this, strength, of this slide. Okay, so positive psychology, good life's model, both have in common that they accentuate the positive, so they are both an example of a strength-based approach. We know strength-based approach work. That's why so many approaches are based on it, so many theories, so many uh, practice um, frameworks, motivational interviewing, solution-focused brief therapy, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, person-centered therapy, um, Carl Rogers, Maslow, um, self-actualizing theory. All of these are strength-based, positive, um, um, <coughs> orientated uh, approaches to working with individuals. And, um, and underneath, we have positive psychology and a good life's model to, to add to those. Um, we have, uh, where we take Rogers, uh, for example, in a person centered, that's important to the good lives model and to the youth empowerment research because that stresses the relationship between the practitioner and the young person. So we need to pay attention to that. Factors and values such as um, you know, unconditional positive regard, warmth, non judgmental attitude, um, empathetic, um, and genuine approach to young people. Um, is what's needed when we work with when we work with them, and we stress that in terms of the person-centered way. And this isn't always the case. Um, previously, when are um, working with um, in rehabilitation, so um, let's not under under um, 
underplay those values that are needed in that relationship. Okay. And so just a little bit more about strengths approach. So I say that the two good life model, positive psychology are um, founded on the strengths approach really and um, the previous model showed you where the strength approach is used in other theoretical approaches and that's for good reasons because we know the strengths approach it's an optimistic approach so it generates uh, optimism it increases the resilience in the young people that's what we're looking for improves relationships so many of these uh, outcomes from a strengths approach are the same outcomes we're looking um, when we work for when we work with young people in order to strengthen them strengthen their inner capabilities um, in order to combat in order to resist radicalism and I'll come on to radicalism in itself a bit more in a minute um, it enhances health and overall well-being helps to develop confidence and self-esteem reduces stress encourages insight and perspective and creates a sense of happiness and fulfillment and that word happiness comes back again because that overlaps with positive psychology whose ultimate aim is to increase happiness um, and well-being and we look internally and externally so while we're working with young people on their internal capabilities self-concept how they look at each other self-confidence we're also mindful of their immediate environment we're also mindful of what's around them political environment social environment, their um, ethnicity, the cultural environment is important, religion, all of these are important. Um, so nothing is left out of this when we talk about strengths. Okay, so I said I wanted to look at briefly the uh, underpinning, um, some of the underpinning legacies from um, underpinning positive psychology and the good lives um, model. I won't spend too long on this slide. Suffice to say that positive psychology has a long um, legacy, stretching back to about 6th century BC with Aristotle and uh, Socrates, except those Greek philosophers who um, themselves stressed the um, importance of happiness in people's life and accentuating the positive the well-being and psychological growth, humanistic psychology, I've mentioned Rogers. Maslow, in fact, was the first person to coin the term positive psychology, although more recently other researchers have tried to claim that for themselves, but it was, in fact, Rogers in his book Motivation and Personality in 1954 that coined that um, um, phrase. So we have now a testy relationship between um, the authors of positive psychology as we know it and um, humanistic psychology only in terms of they differ um, in their approaches to research and uh, in, uh, how they feel um, we should do research in terms of using quantitative approaches or qualitative approaches. So there, are, there is some difference in the approaches and the um, faults of um, humanistic psychologists and positive psychologists. But um, again, like the uh, um, two different approaches to criminology and rehabilitation, they probably have more in common than that divides them. Um, again, some of the underpinning um, values here concern for human agency, the free choice partnership working. Uh, in terms of the good lives model, they, they have a list of primary goods that they feel all humans should aim for. Similarly, positive psychology has a list of what they call character strengths that they feel all young people should aim for. I'm gonna to briefly touch on those in the, one, in the next slides coming up. Both, um, approaches, good life model, positive psychology, assume that people want to be meaningful, meaningful lead good lives. So they um, reject the 
pathologization of young people, so they don't see them as uh, innately bad, they don't blame them for the crime, they assume they want to do well, and they start from that point, and that's an important starting point. And that's a starting point that informs the um, youth empowerment project too, in terms of non-judgmental and wanting to do well in life. Um, both promote a focus on uh, identification and the growth of strengths. Um, workers and practitioners or therapists can help clients to discover their goals. So it's a, it's a joint enterprise between workers and young people. Um, and, and I said, as long as that relationship is informed by values that Rogers outlined in terms of non-judgmental, in terms of um, empathy, then you can form almost a therapeutic alliance, relationship with the young person and work together in partnership. There's concern for both the internal and external state, so how the young person's feeling and see themselves and how they interact with their environment is important. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, both have empirical support through um, research. So there's some of the uh, underpinning, I think, um, messages uh, that we get from both. And I said both have a number of lists or um, values or goals that they aim for uh, to work with the young people. And in terms of good life model, these are the list of um, areas which a practitioner would sit down and discuss with a young person and try to get their aims about where they want to see themselves in relation to some of these um, areas. Um, they would then um, set goals in relation to this, where do you want to get in life? Where do you see yourself in five, ten years' time? And then they would break those goals down into achievable targets and then set a plan to work. And at the end, that good luck, that plan is the good life plan. That's what they work towards. And there's examples of those plans on the uh, internet and how to do them. And similarly, for positive psychology, they have a list of goals that people um, aimed for in life based on six virtues, the wisdom, courage, love, and there's a number of character strengths underneath, again, which all people are said to possess in varying degrees, but which all people can improve on. And so from positive psychology, the aim of achieving a good life, uh, psychological well-being, is to focus on these and do a number of exercises every day until you achieve them. And again, in the, on the internet, there's a number of exercises that you can use with young people on any of these areas, and that would achieve their work towards achieving their um, well-being in life. So the overlaps between um, positive psychology and um, the good life model is clear. So when we come to the Youth Empowerment Project, what does the Good Life Model and Positive Psychology, what, how can they interact? What can they both together um, do for the, uh, uh, for the Good Life Model? We know, as Fion said, what it is. So it aims to investigate um, <coughs> So the research aims to design a prevention framework for minimizing uh, radicalization of young people. And um, that's the top uh, bullet point. And it rests on a number of principles that you see there. The principles are positive, future focused, and um, the internal is as important as the external, and it draws on humanistic ethics. What else I put here? is um, you may be wondering, well then, how do we practically do that with young people? How do we take a group of young people and, um, because the methodology involves a focus group and uh, individual interviews, what kind of questions may, might we ask these young people to try to get a response that would enable us to design tools to, to help and measure them? And so I just put a few questions up there that for discussion, there's a going, going to be a meeting tomorrow uh, where people will delve um, 
respect you. There's going to be a meeting tomorrow where people will delve down and clarify these questions in a bit more depth. But uh, you may have some idea about um, these questions here. So I thought one of the questions will be looking at um, definitions. So what does radicalism uh, mean to you? Perhaps different young people in different countries would have a different um, understanding of what radicalizations mean to them. I saw in a report from Portugal, I think, that young people really don't have a concept of radicalization in that country. Other youth in the UK, for example, I think would have a concept of uh, radicalization. And different communities of youth in different countries would have different ideas. The Muslim youth in um, the UK, I'm sure, would have a, a clear idea of what radicalization means to them, and um, for, for obvious reasons. So I thought we would, that may be a question to uh, ask uh, young people. We'd also ask how would you, I'm not going to go through all these questions, but this is an, an example. We may ask them, how would you advise a friend who seems like they've been influenced by um, extremist uh, messages? And out of that, we may get some um, behavioral descriptors that we can use further on down the line in our research to turn into tools to um, help these young people, and so on. And just to take a, um, another example of question, um, the, the final one, how do you know you belong? We know in terms of radicalization that identity is a big part of it. Um, a, a lot of radical extremist groups target people who um, may be struggling with their identity in a particular community or country and um, so building up someone's concept of who they are and where they belong is important uh, in it to enable them to resist these messages. Um, so yes, so there's just a few examples of some questions there in terms of uh, um, what would inform the Youth Empowerment Project. I put this slide up here because I wanted to uh, um, ensure that for the Youth Empowerment Project, we don't fall into the same trap as um, having radicalization being seen as synonymous with uh, Islam. And we, we know that happens. We, we know that's a, um, a danger. And we, we know there's a number of different extremist groups that exist all around the world, and which, um, but they don't seem to suffer from the same issue of being synonymous with uh, radicalization. And, um, and this comes from the top. Um, I can draw on President Trump um, when um, events happen in the US and uh, he seemed to have no problem in um, naming an event as a terrorist event and he doesn't seem to have any problem in associating or linking that event with Muslims in specifically and, uh, yeah, and Islam. Uh, and yet when other events would happen, it, there may be a problem in linking that or calling it a terrorist event. So we must be careful how we are, um, <coughs> define and um, see and, and label events ourselves. And especially, I know that the prevent agenda in the UK, when it first came out a number of years ago, it made an explicit link between uh, radicalization and um, Islam. Uh, it's got rid of that now, um, but uh, I think the, the damage has been done. So, um, and I know that the Youth Empowerment Project is nowhere near that. There's no hint of an issue with that, but where we come across and where we describe the project to others, we must make sure that we're talking about all types of radicalization, including um, many of the symbols down there that you see, and we're not associating it with one particular um, community as such. Okay, in terms of vulnerability, and I want to um, I'll speed up so that we have some time for um, questions, but I wanted to share this quote with you. So it says, where young people, particularly young men, face a crisis of identity, disconnection, and a lack of purpose and belonging, the evidence um, the evidence suggests that they will be vulnerable to the voice, the forces of radicalization, and uh, they will be vulnerable to those people 
Islamist fundamentalists, gang leaders, or political extremists who can offer them a sense of belonging, opportunity, of identity, and individual power and status. And this is, uh, we, we know that to be true. And uh, that underlines what I, I was saying, in a sense. I want to, OK, let me move on to our, um, just having some quick criticisms of positive psychology. Um, and I won't delay too much on this, so I'm going to criticize positive psychology quite briefly, and then the good lives model briefly. And um, positive psychology is still a sh immature, still a young um, science, and there's a number of different, it needs developing, basically. Um, <clears throat> it's been accused of having a reductionist approach. People are calling it quasi-religious fundamentalism. So if you have a, um, a theory and you're aiming for people to be the best that they can be, um, to aim for a good life, it takes on a kind of religious seal and it's being criticized for that. Um, from a cross-cultural perspective, it's been accused of bordering on psychological imperialism because in that last um, slide, they say it's a bias towards a Western um, view of behavior and um, it overlooks that all behavior is culture bound and um, so it doesn't pay attention enough to other cultures. And in terms of the good life model, our, um, it, it's been criticized for being theoretically naive in a sense in that first bullet point, more or less says that. And our, um, <clears throat> long on popular appeal but short on evidence and saying that there's nothing unique in the good life model and uh, um, that it needs much more evidence. It needs much more um, uh, evidential base. I did touch on um, the problems of definitions. To this, we can add terrorism. Just what do we mean when we talk about extremists, radical, at risk, and vulnerable? Um, who are we talking about? And um, is that culture bound? Do they change according to the country you're in, what, what do young people feel about those are, um, um, definitions? And again, in terms of definitions, it's important how a society defines um, these terms because then that would dictate their response to them. So um, if you say it doesn't matter what we call them, they are what they are, it does matter because if you can find yourself in different being treated differently as according to how um, a society views you. If you're on one of these camps, you may even think yourself quite moderate, quite reasonable. Other people will put you in a different camp, of course. Okay, so in terms of radicalization, there's, we know there's a number of push-pull factors. Any of these factors can go either side of that. And, um, in truth, it's probably a mix of both, push-pull from internal or external. Um, and um, we know the Good Life Project and the um, Positive Psychology works on a number of these factors in terms of identity and belonging, etc. So we do engage with that. And um, we're coming up to uh, finish soon, but in terms of re-engaging communities, um, there's a number of things we can do. Young people must be empowered um, um, to be engaged politically in society. That's all young people we're talking about. Um, there's a number of young people on the margins. There seem to be, um, you know, then on the edges of society, we need to re-engage with these young people and uh, um, politically and socially in order to... Uh, um, in order to move forward. We need to create safe spaces for young people. And um, I'm gonna take one more. We need to equip them with the skills that they need. And it's the good life's model and positive psychology that really works on equipping them, as I said, internally and externally with the skills and the capabilities that they need and require. So there's a number of takeaway um, questions and thoughts I have here for you. But before I do that, let me just share a, an anecdote with you. 
Um, in London the other day, there was a, there was a trial. I think there was three and at risk of conflating um, Islam with um, radicalization. I do draw on that. For an example here, there was a trial of three um, people on trial for terrorist activities. One of them was a teacher in a school. And, um, and he made no um, <clears throat> pretense about radicalizing, trying to radicalize the pupils in that school. He taught pupils 11 to 16, and he would radic try to radicalize them by showing them videos of beheadings, etc. And uh, it, it struck me, and I was thinking about the young pupils in that school, uh, leaving aside him being in, on trial and a punishment, etc. But those young people, now I wondered, first of all, he was doing that for a long time, and there was no reports that he, that any of the pupils or their parents or other teachers reported this activity um, to the uh, um, authorities. That's one thing. But from the young people's point of view, I wondered how they received the messages that they got from him, how the 11 year olds received, whether they received those messages, whether they had the um, internal uh, confidence and the capabilities to reject those messages. messages. What about the 16 year olds? Is there a difference between how 11 year olds receive the messages and how 16 year olds receive those messages? Mm -hmm. uh, that's been told in three minutes. <laughs> uh, um, and more to the point, what happens now? Are these young people now um, seen to be vulnerable? Are these now young people seen to be at risk for having been subject to radicalization by this teacher? What um, are the authorities' responses to that? We don't know. We just know about the, the trial. But, uh, but I was curious about what happened to the young people. Um, and because that's you know, very relevant to our um, research, basically, in terms of um, how we can strengthen young people to resist the messages of radicalization. Okay, so what I want you to take away is that the whole area um, in terms of uh, research into the good lives model and um, positive psychology, there are some evidences of good research going on, but they do lack randomized controlled trials and control groups. Um, to me, a lot of anti-radicalization um, activities sounds like good youth work, sounds like good youth work. And um, the government is busy in the UK uh, cutting to the bone youth work, where train people, work with young, young people in meaningful activities. That's being cut. And so youth are left to themselves. Um, I talked about the problem of Islam becoming synonymous with radicalization. We do have problems with definitions. We talked about that. Um, I like that the Youth Empowerment Project is not, foc is a, um, pro is, sorry, not problem focused. Instead, it's positive. Um, De-radicalization literature itself is quite young. It's quite young, as is um, positive psychology and good life um, and good life model. And so all of these areas are academically underdeveloped, and so we need more research on them. We need more academic attention, and the Youth Empowerment Project can add to that. Um, Extremist ideology is aimed at giving young people an identity and a purpose. And, um, and I think that Youth Empowerment Project um, is working to give them that too. So in a sense, we are trying to provide some counter narrative to that. And, um, and, and finally, I'll leave you with um, the Good Lives Project, the Good Lives Model, is essentially a rehabilitative model of um, intervention, whereas the Youth Empowerment Project is um, <clears throat> it's, it's not. Um, so I wondered whether there was a, a, a slight contradiction there or, or whether that mattered in terms of one was involved with young people after they commit a crime and they may well have the label of offender, but one is preventative. Okay? So we are basing a pre preventative approach on a rehabilitative model. And I wonder if there's a slight contradiction there. Maybe not. Anyway, so I hope I are, um, haven't bored you to tears. I hope you're still awake. I hope you've taken at least one thought away from 
from what you hear that you can perhaps want to follow up um, with questions or find out for yourself on the internet. But whatever the case, I thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Sinclair Coward, for your brilliant exposition. Uh, and thank you for reacting so graciously to my little pressure because of our time frame. Is now we have an opportunity for asking questions. Now, I know that most people feel kind of shy, uh, but you must realize that you are not here to you know, provide some kind of performance. So you are not going to be judged because you said something very clever. Uh, that is an opportunity for you. It's basically an opportunity. If you are curious about what you heard, or if you are in disagreement, as it could well be, with what you heard, uh, the time for speak up your mind, which is, by the way, one of the main tenets of this project, uh, is now. <laughs> so if you have the will to ask a question, please step up to the podium and you will be able to do that. Oh. Please. Yeah, I think you have to come here. Just pass the mic. It's a mic question. Yeah. But, oh yeah. No pressure, first question. <laughs> um, thank you for your presentation. Um, the last point that you made was what I was thinking kind of throughout about the prevention and uh, rehabilitation. Um, I kind of got slightly confused about who was the subject to these models, um, talking about re-engaging communities. So who are these re like unengaged individuals? How do we find them and how do they kind of get on board with these kind of models? It's, sorry, I just kind of didn't have that clear in my head. And how do we identify these people? That's my question. Yeah. Well, that's a great question because it goes to the uh, um, it goes to the heart of who 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 are we talking about in terms of vulnerable? Who are who is vulnerable to these messages? When we talk about radicalization, are we talking? Are we targeting certain communities, or is everybody, every young person, vulnerable? Um, when it talks about re-engaging communities, it's about um, rather than re-engaging, it should really say engaging. So we need to engage everybody because um, all of us have a stake in this. Um, you know, no, nobody can turn around and say um, <clears throat> it's nothing to do with them. It's to do with everybody in society. It's a, it's a human issue. And um, in terms of the Youth Empowerment Project, I know they're focused on four different environments um, in schools, in youth offending, in universities and online, uh, which is where you find a number of people. And those four environments, I'm, I'm sure that they will tell us how they were, they were selected. But I think they mirror the prevent environments, do they not? And um, so in answer to your question, who, um, who are we talking about? In a sense, we're talking about everybody. All young people in society um, are targeted for this. And uh, in a sense also, that's why I'm made the, the claim, to the plea, not to um, look at any particular communities for attention for de-radicalization or radicalization attention, uh, attention because it affects everybody in society and we're, we're, we're all in it together, basically. I don't know if, that, if that's sufficient. I don't know, Theo, if you wanted to ask. Yeah, it's a, fa it's a fair question. I kind of falls within the current way of thinking of, for prevention. So I, anyone should expect that question. But what, what the entire project is trying to do is actually turn that question in its head. Um, and it's not about profiling. It's in fact, it's the opposite. Because it's not, if, if you go down the road of profiling and say oh, they're between this age and from this particular religion and from this particular economic background, and da -da 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 -da, then you're actually falling into the trap that we're currently in. Um, so if you think about it in terms of practical tools, you know, this would be an empowerment, because we've talked about this different environment, it would be an empowerment tool that would have sense for a, t a school teacher. 
And it's not about the school teacher and scratching their head and thinking, okay, if I do my 30 pupils in this classroom, who, you know, two or three might be at risk of radicalization? Again, that's the wrong way of looking at it. This is what we mean. We're going to turn everything around and not think in the risk way, but think in the positive, empowering way. Um, the four environments were selected because um, the European Commission <laughs> identified those four environments. And in all honesty, I mean, they are the most you know, common and, you know, environments where these sort of activities or, you know, or at least where young people might be exposed. Of course, the, the biggest environment is the community, you know, and we're not excluding that. And, you know, that might include, I don't know, places where um, people go and hang out. You know, it could be you know, playgrounds, it could be, I don't know, um, for some specific communities, it would be the hairdresser. <laughs> you know, where they go and cut their hair or where they go and have a coffee. Uh, we're not excluding those, those environments as long as they make uh, sense. And uh, we're going to have an interesting chat all day tomorrow about um, the second phase where the field work is going to happen. And yes, we say we're going to be in schools. Yes, we're going to be in um, kind of formal environments, but that doesn't mean that we're not going to be out there uh, having conversations where young people actually go. Yeah, and well said. And as I said before, I actually think that um, the best place for this work is youth work. That's where it should be situated, where you train up people to work with young people, wherever they are, wherever they hang out on the streets, wherever they go to clubs for recreation, and you, you train young people in the... Uh, um, in the arts of good life model, positive psychology, to work with young people wherever they find them, rather than having specific projects here, specific funded projects here, just work with the whole community to the tenants of the good life model and the positive psychology. And that, that's best, I think, rather than our, um, saying that you're going to target any particular uh, area. But there's a cost and there's money, and I guess part of the challenge to us is to... Um, <clears throat> is to prove the benefit of these models, prove that they work, prove that they work in this regard in terms of um, radicalization, and then make the case to whoever holds the purse string that this is the way we should be going down to train people on this and really put money behind general youth work to work with all youths around the EC on this because then we would reap the benefits in years to come in terms of uh, um, some of these programs. There is still time for a couple of questions, if anybody volunteers. And of course, you don't need to speak a fluent English. You know, you can speak in Italian, a translation will be provided, or you can, international, which means broken English, is perfectly acceptable in an international conference. You know that, of course. Good morning, everybody, and um, I'm Alessandro Rosa, and I've got a question to ask to Professor Coward. And, um, well, thank you, Professor, for your very interesting presentation, during which I can help uh, um, um, kind of pinning down the links to my personal field of study, which is philosophy of law and theory of human rights. And I'm actually uh, carrying out this PhD and this PhD thesis on the, the topic of um, um, uh, the hate speech and the philosophical and legal debate and hate speech. And I think we share common ground because uh, many of the categories uh, used uh, in a good lives model and uh, in the, for the positive psychology are the same categories uh, used uh, in the debate, uh, so as for example, human dignity and also human um, human agency, uh, which is one of the most used. And uh, speaking of which, I would like to ask you, since these you explained are uh, models um, with which I, I have to admit that uh, I totally agree with, but I would like to ask you, how would you uh, say that those models could uh, be shaped onto the reality of the particular crimes of hate speech to prevent them as forms, because I really think they are, as forms of radicalizations. They can get to be forms of radicalizations in young people. So which in particular, what in particular do you think could be the measures, particular measures to address this problem uh, of hate speech and to prevent that? Thank you. 
Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure there. I know that are, um, <coughs> th those philosophical roots that you talk about inform um, projects and programs going forward. It, as to, um, so some of the thinking behind them informs the, the project. So we're talking about those two. Um, we, we, when we talk about good life model and positive psychology, they're informed by those um, deep-rooted philosophical ideas about the good, goodness and um, values of the morals, etc. And as to whether, uh, you know, if I take your question right, as to whether they in themselves could um, uh, constitute an, an intervention, um, I, I, I wouldn't know. I, what I would know is that they do form both, um, the rationale, basically, a justification of, of some of, of the of those interventions, um, rather than forming the intervention in and of themselves, um, and really, in a sense, that was my that was one of the aims here to show you how um, the thinking um, from those um, philosophical ideas underpin uh, the good life model and underpin um, the youth empowerment project, and are, um, <clears throat> just through their aims, just through some of the outcomes and some of the um, some of the ambitions that they have uh, to achieve in life. Uh, um, uh, I, uh, that's it, really. Really, they, they do form the uh, the basis of our, our research. I'm not sure if you uh, whether you have yeah. anything else to add to that. I mean, all this all the discussion about radicalization is not linear. It's a continuum, and hate speech, hate crimes, um, hate attitudes is part of that continuum. Um, in the book, we've put references uh, where the there's links between the hate crime and the literature. And you're probably going to hear uh, about restorative justice today. Um, there's several publications we're going to put on the website on restorative justice and hate crime. And why am I connecting the two? Because once you have the hate attitudes that lead to hate speech, and as a consequence, hate speech radicalizing individuals, um, you've got to look at what are the factors that create those attitudes. Okay, So whether it's an attitude uh, towards uh, a person of a different race, of a different religion, of a different uh, sexual orientation, of disability, and all sorts of things, right? So if you have created those um, attitudes for one reason or another, and in fact the literature on hate attitudes and hate crimes is quite thorough, um, there are different categories and you know, all sorts of categories of you know, uh, types of offenders and typologies and so on and so forth. Um, so if you look at those, Again, if you turn that on its head and say, so if you're not looking at it, oh, we've got the issue, how do you rehabilitate the uh, offender? What is the cultural awareness? What are the tools that you can provide them in the hope that they would address those attitudes that then lead to the, um, to the actions that are the result of those attitudes? The fact that we're working with young people creates the best group for having potential of changing those attitudes. Again, in the hate crime literature, they're breaking down to different age groups, and the older you get, the more solid your attitudes and perceptions are towards somebody else. The younger you are, the more chances you have to have um, a different view. right? And that's why we all have to take responsibility for creating those views. It's not the young person's views, it's our society's views, our school's views, our family views that are imposed onto young people. And then as a consequence, you have the hate attitudes that then might lead to radicalization. All these things are connected. And what we're trying to do is look at it from a holistic point of view, take a step back. And whether you're a school teacher, whether you work in a prison, look at the topic of radicalization and the paths that lead to it from that holistic perspective. Just in terms of the dialogue and you know, not taking forward you know, your, you know, or, or asking questions now, there is um, on Twitter and on Facebook ways you can ask questions and contribute. So if you have phones, if you've got computers or whatever, and you want to ask the question now, you can go on Twitter, use hashtag there or on Facebook can put your question there and we'll try and do our best and answer. If we don't have the time now, we're definitely going to come back to you and, and answer your questions. Or if you just have a comment and just say, what, what are you talking about? You know, this is not going to work for me. Just go on there, just put the comment um, and we'll collect those comments. And if we have enough by the end of the conference, 
we'll write them down and then when I come back I'll go through your comments. So let's carry on the conversation.